So in the last session, we uh, basically had an introduction and I wanted to take you all to the basics of um, what we are going to do in the course and also where payments are going. And this, this course is really about where, uh, where, the, where payments are going because it is changing, right? It's, it's radically changing. And um, we felt it was very important for the bankers to know these changes. Um, can I, I actually asked um, IBSL to give me a list of uh, where you work, and I think almost all of you are from banks except one. Um, is there anyone with uh, who has been involved in payments? Uh, Uh, Dapuran, would you like to just let me know what your background is? Because we are now, the reason I'm asking is we are now slowly going into sort of more complex concepts and all of that. And I, it would be useful to know where what your background is. Um, if anyone would like to start. Yeah, so this, I mean, my background yes, is, uh, uh, yeah, my background Sorry? is compliance. You're with compliance. So are you, yeah. are you uh, from a legal background? Uh, not like that, but uh, for for last five years, I've been in compliance department as uh, assistant manager there. All right. Okay. So, your um, is this course compulsory for you to take, or do you are you taking it as an option? Uh, I, I just want to know the background. Uh, just an option because I wanted to do a postgraduate. That's that's why. Okay. Very good. Um, so, what, do you have any questions from the last session? Anything that uh, you that sort of struck you that uh, we should uh, focus on or something of interest to you? Anything? Uh, not like that, not like that. All okay. okay. Um, Gayatri? Gayatri, can you let me know from which uh, bank you're from? Sorry, Dapar, and I forgot to ask you which bank are you from? Uh, from Pan Asia Bank. All right, okay. Uh, if not Gayatri, I, uh, Sachin or Shampika, you could answer as well. I'm just going from the from the order that your names appear on my screen. That's all. Hi, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Yeah. Gayatri, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Gayatri, you're working at Bank of Ceylon, Hatton Branch. Hatton Branch, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice. It's very nice. Uh, so it must be easy for you to join online rather than coming to IBSL. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Uh, so which uh, uh, department are you attached to? Uh, in the, in the uh, I'm branch? working as a personal banking officer, but now I'm working as a cash officer. Right, so you're 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 directly dealing with customers, no? Yes. Yes. So, are you uh, seeing any change in the uh, in the types of requests that customers? Come yes, to you? yeah, you yeah. Should... Most of the people asking for the internet banking facilities uh, after the COVID pandemic. Uh, most of, most of the people are like to open uh, smart gen accounts, like passbook free accounts. So yeah. they are moving a little bit moving to new generation. <laughs> Do, do you see any uh, sort of in the demographics are they sort of because uh, Hatton I think has a big like a very yeah, wide yeah, demographic. Yeah. Uh, Hatton has uh, no uh, much more educated people but yeah. uh, those people are like to involve in new activities. Uh, we are explained them in very well uh, so they would like to join with us to uh, take that experience. Uh, I think a digitalized experience. So most of the accounts we are opening as a passbook free accounts. Uh, Bank of Ceylon has introduced a passbook free account. Uh, it called as smart gen account. So most of the people like to use these facilities without any hesitation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very good. And I think uh, from what I've heard in in the Hatton area, uh, though people are not very educated, they all have very smartphones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Though they are not educated, they all have the smartphones. <laughs> yeah, so the, if yeah. they can leapfrog this. Yes. Uh, like in China, they can just uh, pass all the steps and go directly yeah. to uh, mobile <laughs> banking and mobile payments, which is very good. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, so. So the central bank is also we are doing quite a lot. Uh, to um, 
uh, facilitate that and encourage that and we really want people to go there yeah and uh, i think i think the banks are playing a playing a very big role <laughs> in uh, in uh, teaching people because you all are the you all are the faces right we don't uh, meet the customers so i think uh, the the uh, today we will be discussing that how the uptake of um, yeah. payment instruments yeah so thank you for that gayatri yeah. uh, champika would you like to tell us something about yourself yes ma'am uh, i am from hdfc housing development finance corporation bank yeah uh, uh, hdfc at, yeah hdfc working yeah. at nikaranti branch as a recovery officer so all the recoveries are handled by me so in uh, in uh, so hdfc this is the recoveries of uh, mortgages and housing loans right yeah 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 all, is all. that yeah is that all that uh, hdfc does or does hdfc do other do you have other uh, products as well yeah so the product is current loans as well as and uh, mortgage loans and uh, leasing also there yeah. okay right so so you have to you're the person so are you um, in the are you a sort of a, how long have you been in banking uh, uh, champaki uh, it's uh, about 9 years okay because recoveries is a tough job right uh, the sales and marketing people have the easy job uh, yeah. getting the money back from the customer is the difficult job from what we have seen uh people like to take loans but don't like to pay loans um so uh from your experience do you see customers changing their habits or the way that they like to repay their loans do they still come to the bank with the check or how do they do bank transfers how how has it changed yeah it's a little bit changed right now because most of the people are using the internet banking and this one called mobile banking as well we are also encourage them to get the mobile banking app because um, without the working hours they can pay anything they can pay their early summons as well and some people you know that at the covid 19 19 period branches was closed and most of people calling us in mobiles how to, how how can i pay this then i say use the mobile banking use the internet payments then you can uh, pay the regular your payments most of the people are you know, now asking them how we can do easy way that's a, i think yeah, i think that's that's what we are all, all noticing is that once people start using these uh, they recognize the uh, convenience and they don't kind of want to go back and that's a good thing even for us personally once we download the app and start paying now i don't go anywhere to pay any of my bills all the bills uh, i pay uh, from my app and it's so convenient any time in the night and i think that's really what we want um, want to uh, do and uh, i think we are lucky because our, our banking network is very wide and it's going all over the country so people can directly join the banking network itself without going for any alternative means and i think that's a real advantage uh, sri lanka is having at the moment thank you for that champika uh, sachin would you like to add something tell us something about yourself Yeah, Sachin doesn't seem to be. Um, I don't know, but we can't hear him. Uh, Gayan, uh, I joined. Uh, Gayan, would you? So everybody is uh, sort of giving us something about their background, uh, where they are attached to, and what they do. Would you like to uh, introduce yourself, Gayan? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm uh, still, uh, of course, uh, they have mentioned as Gayan. Uh, well, oh, I'm uh, working for NTB currently, so. actually my uh, career runs about 24 years now so initially okay. was at hnb for 17 long years and then moved to panasia and then uh, for the last 3 years at ntb uh, all right so actually i was uh, involved in credit evaluation and all those stuff and now into branch banking for the last 6 7 years uh, so my experience also now the Uh, there are uh, so much of uh, clients getting into the digital channels 
So we at NTP also promoting very much uh, the digital um, channels that we do have at uh, NTP. Uh, I think that's something that uh, we should uh, absorb. Yeah, I, I think this is Nations Trust Bank, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, NTB I think is uh, quite uh, forward in uh, the digitalization process and they, they took some major steps uh, ahead of the others. And I think uh, that that's a benefit. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the, the, the popularization of free me really helped in the rest of the apps also picking up. So I think that is, I think you have a, you have a former fan Asia uh, colleague also um ah, yes. from I have a driver and I know to him yeah and he yes. was also an exception <laughs> ah okay uh, so um oh, what is your experience now you you have 24 years in the banking what is yeah. your do you see a change in the uh sort of what you see how do you see the branches changing um uh, uh, yes pretty much uh, yeah uh, yes, a lot of observation in the, uh, the overall banking. Now, uh, the days we started, of course, it was almost like the manual system we had. Of course, the, some of the functions like uh, uh, loans were uh, sort of a manual system. Only we had all those. Things. Uh, only the current and savings was uh, in the co-banking system. So thereafter, we started and uh, as time passed, uh, we saw that a lot of uh, decentralization happened. Uh, and I don't know, maybe it's cost effective and uh, uh, for the bank wise, uh, but the problem is now in terms of the knowledge of the, the younger generation uh, I don't think uh, the amount of knowledge that they have for certain functions of uh, banking uh, is as much as that we uh, do uh, know about them uh, it's challenging when we uh, lead those kind of people uh, as managers yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a common problem um, yeah. that a lot of people are facing because, because of digitalization and, and, uh, and systems becoming so, when we used to do manual processes, we have to learn it step by step. Mm -hmm. And now in the digitalization process, a lot of those steps, um, get, uh, we don't have to do them. So therefore, they don't learn it. And But of course, banking is something that is an art of its own so when you don't know these processes it becomes a problem and and i, th I think that's why we try from the, these courses we try our best to uh, try to capture the historic aspect as well and i am i, I even today's lecture I, I i always touch on the history of it because people need to know why and yes even the last lecture that's why i i went to the very basics of you know why we are using cash and currency because um if we forget why we are doing it the basics because everything is now sort of covered behind the mobile screen so the mobile screen will be very pretty but if people don't know what's happening behind the mobile screen, especially the bankers um, it becomes problematic because if something goes wrong they don't know how to solve that problem they really need to know what's going on behind it so thank you uh, let's see if um, Sachin has uh, emerged um, Sachin are you there no Right. Uh, so let's start. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for your input. And I would, uh, since you're all very, the reason I wanted to know what your backgrounds were was, uh, it, it really helps me in, in how I uh, discuss uh, the, the course with you because um, I, I, I was having a real difficulty in gauging as to where I should pitch this. I also wanted to know uh, what level of sort of theory, um, uh, and and sort of the conceptual side that y'all are interested in, um, because payments has a lot of new. It 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 it, uh, it takes up a sort of a new area of economics um, based on network economics and platform economics. So, 
let's do today's course and let me know on my last slide which is not actually in your slide deck i added it later um is 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 going on that so let me know whether you would like a, a theoretical discussion on uh, payments and platforms because this is really how things are going forward um and it's it, and it's actually quite interesting because uh the the main theory uh, actually won the Nobel uh, Economics Prize. Um, so if you are interested, then next next uh, lesson I can I can uh, uh, discuss the theoretical constructs in detail. So let's start. I will put up my presentation. Sorry. Right, can you see my screen? Interesting. Yes, can see you now. Yes, okay, right. Um, so today we are going to look at evolution of uh, payment instruments. Uh, basically how, uh, touching on what we just discussed, uh, on how historically payment instruments are changing. Um, and the reason that I have this is because, as I mentioned just a while ago, it's very important to know where things are changing. And we also need to realize that some of them are not going. Uh, the instruments themselves are there, but they are evolving in nature. So we need to notice how this uh, process of the instrument and the technologies uh, uh, process of the instrument is changing with technology. So the, uh, and and we will sort of become we will we will see that we are sort of going in a circle conceptually. So uh, in the core structure I that I shared with you last time. So this is where we are. We are in the second uh, point, uh, which is um, the evolution of uh, the payment instruments and technology. And uh, we will then, uh, if we if you uh, want, we can discuss uh, the theoretical concept next time, or we can go into the institutional framework. But I think it'll be interesting for us to discuss uh, the theoretical concepts, uh, which will actually be useful for you in your uh, in policy and planning. So as always, um, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll try to take a break, uh, let's say about 10 o'clock. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes and either we can take two breaks or we can take one 20 minute break. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, until that time, of course, please keep your microphones on mute. Um, so actually I said raise your hand, but I can't see you raising your hand because of the way uh, Google Meet takes up the entire screen. So um, just speak directly if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, engage just I'm very I, I make these slides with time for discussion so please share your experiences and your views it's really important uh, because we have because it gives us local uh, practical context um, and in application in these um, in these new changes that are coming um, and I and from my discussion with you just now and I know I know that you all are I can see that you all are very experienced. You have a very wide range of experience. So please share it. It will benefit all of us. Um, it will benefit me also as a central banker because uh, it 
uh, understanding how the market is responding is very important for us uh, when we come up with our policies as well. So please uh, feel free to interrupt and discuss at any time. There is sufficient time. I I leave room for for um, discussion in the when I set up the um, presentation. So today uh, we will discuss the digital payment instruments, which is uh, so we already. Um, Last time we discussed all the payment instruments. Um, I won't go into paper-based instruments because the course is focusing on um, digital instruments and uh, and there's quite a bit of it. So let's uh, go to that and, and go uh, one by one to see how the changes are taking place. So the digital instruments, now cards, those of you who've been involved in cards um, know that cards, I mean, initially we used to call these electronic payments and we still can call them electronic payments. But uh, since everything is moving to full on digital, we put cards also as digital. And cards are very, very interesting uh, payment instruments. It's uh, because I, I, I find that the card probably is the most versatile payment instrument that we've seen um, historically because it has been able to change itself from a paper card to a plastic card and now a virtual card so and um, it it really has remained relevant it has not no matter mobile payments coming up there safe's type of um, just pay uh, safe's directly a uh, direct access to bank accounts coming up cards have been able to maintain for many reasons and they have kept on innovating themselves and really responding to the changes. So cards are very, very important and a lot of the payment theories actually emerged from cards um, because it's very interesting how they have managed a complex market and uh, remained relevant and so learning how that happens is, is very useful and then we have internet-based payments when we talk about internet-based payments we're actually talking about um, a very um, limited scope which is uh, internet banking based payments and what we know is that uh, all of you have been dis uh, uh, highlighting how customers are moving to internet-based uh, internet uh, banking um, e increasingly we are having um, more and more uh, integrations into internet banking now uh, now we can pay our taxes directly pay the customs from the lanka um, lanka pay online payment platform which we will discuss when we are discussing the uh, payment infrastructures so we are finding that uh, that that the concept of the payment instrument we, it's something that we have to discuss which is do we is the payment instrument itself disappearing um are we talking about a future where there is no need for a payment instrument because you can directly access your your money or if not if a payment instrument remains then why does it remain why what is there that the payment instrument provides us that direct access doesn't why is the payment instrument more advantageous than directly accessing uh, your bank account so those are things that we need to consider because uh, one reason is it's it, it the payment instruments have been there for a long time for over like almost now 200 years and the other is if you take our banks we have entire uh, departments uh, entire sections dedicated to payment instruments a, a whole group of people who are involved in checks whole group of people who are in, involved in credit cards um, and then with regard to debit cards and then when when so we there is a human element to this as well you know digitalizing is not just not just uh, changing um, changing um, the the nature of the instrument or the or the way the service is provided and you will see that even in your banks you know someone who was doing some manual process uh, might suddenly be looking redundant 
so there is a human aspect as well uh, have you all uh, have you all exp experienced this with with digitalization having vrss or anything like that uh yes very much so they will deploy money on uh, the fixed asset that uh, digital fixed asset mm -hmm. so thereby they want to get rid of the human resource that uh, in lieu of that yeah so so the, the, this is and i think this is one reason why credit cards are, are so versatile and constantly uh, evolving so that they remain relevant right so ideally in a in a in a market where now there are mobile apps and uh, just pay where you can directly access the question of why people are paying 3% uh, for a credit card payment or a debit card payment um we have we we really have to question why is it happening is it good or bad uh, and how are, are they remaining relevant so these are very important things because the impact of digitalization is much wider and and as bankers as policy makers um, as as leaders in your in your in your industry it's really important to look at both the digital and the non digital impact of um, digitalization so it's very important um, and um, this is what we need to look at and then we have e money which is uh, primarily uh, mobile money uh, which is uh, easy cash uh, in cash in sri lanka and uh, we'll discuss about that because that has in sri lanka there it's not so big but globally it has had a big impact as a payment instrument uh, for because in many countries um, there are a lot of unbanked people and this has really um, had a huge impact in their lives uh, for people uh, below at the bottom of the pyramid uh, that is uh, the, the poor of the uh, classes um gayatri i just want you to know is uh, is there a high usage of uh, uh, e money mobile money in uh, the hatton area Is guy through there? Uh, yes, ma'am. In uh, so easy cash, M cash. Do you see a lot of use of that in that area? Uh, um, mobile money? Uh, not little, but li little bit uh, experience in this uh, easy, easy cash, because most of the people get uh, deceived from the easy cash systems. It means uh, the in dialogue is a cash payment system. Most of the people are deceived by them. Uh, most people are doing the fraudulent activities through this easy cash. That's uh, oh, really that's sorry. So 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 it it doesn't have a good reputation, is it? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> right, right, right. So the, the so these are problems. Let's discuss this when we when we get to e money. So these are the practical problems. So while dialogue is a perfectly uh, a perfectly legal and legitimate uh, company and they have K they adhere to kyc guidelines and all of that we have this practical issue and then uh, people's acceptance uh, of a payment instrument so just because a payment instrument works people might not want to be associated with that uh, just the way like say young people don't want to be associated with cash you know it's not cool for them uh, the same way some people might not want to be associated with something that uh, that is known to be used for frauds or crimes or things like that so um, these are the other aspects we don't we we, we often measure uh, uh, digital products or any of our products from the efficiency of its function itself so is it sending money from a to b fast and you know without um, without any extra cost and you know without any risk to the system but actually there is a much wider uh, social consideration as well so we have we first discussed the the labor aspect of it the hr aspect of it and now we are seeing another aspect is which is uh, people don't want to be associated with it because they think that you know it's only for for, for like fraudulent activities um so that's another problem so then we have mobile apps and mobile apps uh, have been very popular and all i think all of your banks have uh, have mobile apps uh, uh, in place now um 
and we'll discuss that because mobile apps is a it's a very wide a very 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 wide area and um, there's a lot of things to discuss there and then here smart devices um, which is you know the it's no longer only the mobile phone that can make the payment there are other devices as well then we have qr code and then e checks uh, it's something that uh, we can, we might be able to see in the future in Sri Lanka. So let's talk about this. And then we have virtual currency. So now, point number two was all so sort of uh, systems that use central bank money, right? Uh, that is the money that we use, and through the banking systems, even e-money has a has a custodian bank. So number three, virtual currencies. Now we are talking about payment instruments as always. So I don't want to limit you to what is only there in uh, central bank money. We have to see what is the alternative because even in the last last um, last lecture that we discussed, uh, we discussed you know going back to barter, rejecting the system. We have to remember this. It's very very important. To us we we shouldn't be complacent. This is the this is the be all and the end all of. Um, uh payments uh, that central bank money is the only way we have to know that when a problem arises or when uh, that it is a market we have to remember that there is a market and that there can be competition even though it is regulatory safe and all that it can be uh, there can be competition so therefore uh, we, let's discuss about alternative uh, payment systems or payment uh, currencies that have emerged for various reasons in the world um and then let's go back to Let's go to the latest development, which is uh, digital uh, central bank digital currency. So last week, right, we I showed this diagram, right. So we are basically this is basically what we are discussing today. Each point, we are not going to discuss cash and money orders and checks. We're going to look at the rest of it and um, what really is going on here. Right, um, I'm going to show you a video um, on the timeline, just to sort of give you, it. I, I found this interesting, uh, just to give you an idea of the bad thing started. Can you hear? Uh, I think can't hear. Sounds okay. Let me see how we can do this. I'll try to increase my volume. Let's see whether it helps. Is it better now? Uh, not really for me. I don't know about the others. Okay. Um. Thank 
Right. Um, let's see the calculus this. And then, oops. Sorry, just give me a sec. I'll just get the. Right. Can you see the presentation again? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, basically, the reason I put, uh, gave gave you that um, showed you that um, uh, uh, that little video was. I'm sorry you didn't hear it, but I think there was some uh, they had some text on it, um, which is that uh, one point that was very interesting for me was uh, what we value. Right. So the social idea of what we value and this, we often see this when there's inflation, um, people go back to gold. <coughs> so when currencies often, um, <coughs> sorry, currencies often um, are things that we in some form value. So now it makes sense for us to have digital tokens because we see more value in them um, because they, they are more functionally useful for us because we have mobile phones and computers. <clears throat> um, and, and so that, that struck me when I saw the Chinese spade because they were an agricultural society and they thought uh, for them the spade was something useful. Um, and so we have to realize that though someone might say, oh, you know, it's a digital token, it means nothing. If you're someone who's always using the computer and using everything in a digital form that idea that it doesn't it doesn't have value doesn't really strike you so that's very important and this 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 idea strikes a lot when we come to virtual currencies because that's what virtual currencies are they're just pieces of software code but they're very very valuable for no particular reason because they're not they in they them they in themselves have no a property where they can execute any useful uh, program or anything like that but um, they're just a software code just like fiat money just like the paper money we have but it has a lot of people have given it a lot of value so this idea of how people impute value into uh, payment instruments and and coins and notes um, is very it's 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 a, it's connected to the society um, historically we found that gold the shiny metal like why gold why not uh, iron or steel or any other uh, gold was a shiny metal that had a lot of good properties people liked it so uh, now if you take virtual currencies uh, as we will discuss later it has certain qualities that suit this time of the day um and then the other was again going to the concept of um of of how currencies are created is uh, I I don't know whether you heard it or saw it. There was a coin with a monkey on it, and that was made by uh, traders in uh, in Suffolk, I think. And uh, that was because there weren't enough coins to go around at that time in the 1600s or so. There weren't enough coins to go around, so people created their own coins, right? So we have to understand. Uh, so this really sort of goes into things like uh, money supply and um, all these all uh, it's related to all this where where alternative coins alternative money gets created so, th so that's really why i wanted to show this to you and then we have the move the 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 movement to the credit card so this also uh, facilitates a dif different purpose 
let's see. So, so I put up a little timeline um, as to as to where things started. Um, so there is the major changes that we saw in the world, and then concurrently in Sri Lanka. So um, now around 1946, right? So it's not so long ago, you know. It's it's not as long. It's not. It's less than. Um, it's around 100 years ago that all this, um, the process of um, going into systems, into digital, electronic digital systems started. It's not, it's not so long ago. So we have to remember that we are still working on a very short timeline, with short um, experience. So um, in 1967 was when the first ATM started. And in Sri Lanka, the first ATM was in 1986. So it took us a little time, almost 20 years, to um, to get 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 to this point of met, meeting the West with uh, the ATMs. And then if you take the credit cards, it's even more, right? So it's 1989 that the commercial bank started uh, issuing credit cards. But I remember those days credit like most people didn't even understand the concept of credit cards it's now that with, with all this marketing that uh, people understand uh, the credit cards uh, is there anyone who was involved in uh, credit card issuing in the in the sort of uh, the 90s or um the early 2000s sorry early th early 2000s is there anyone with uh, any experience uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those, yeah, those days uh, we were very selective uh, when uh, giving cards to clients and uh, we only went for the high net worth people. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of a different uh, situation now. I think everyone is uh, holding a card uh, nowadays yes i think now what we are seeing is uh, somewhat similar to what uh, ba uh, what bank of america did when they initially started uh, the 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 credit card which is they mailed it to everyone and they didn't ask whether people knew because they just wanted people to start using it. It's like giving things for free uh, at the beginning. But I think now also we are seeing a change in the economy where there are more employed people and there's more people with salaries. So banks, there's a lot less risk involved um, than uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I think there's a structural change in the in the economy and the labor market so that it's uh, it's not so bad of course the, it is an issue and i think you might be do you do you feel that this this current way of sort of uh, it, is, it, is does it have a problem to your balance sheet or recoveries um, and even the others do you have well, when it comes to credit cards is it becoming a problem uh, the widespread uh, use of uh, widespread issuing of credit cards Anyone who, uh, uh, anyone who's involved in uh, uh, that one from your compliance side, do you see any? No. Okay, because I, 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 yeah. Anyway, that now, now, now banks are uh, one. If one bank issue a card with a limit, some other banks acquiring that card with that limit, and they are paying that card. That uh, customer will, if, if the customer is using, uh, is going to use two cards at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, you know they will may they may be default. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for example, X Bank is issuing a card for hundred thousand limit. The customer is already used fifty thousand, and uh, uh, he is uh, transferring that fifty thousand limit to the bank. Uh, then he is having hundred thousand for this bank, and he will use this bank card and another bank card that will 
that will make a default situation sometimes you know that kind of a situations are coming in right 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 no this is this is a, this is these are so the we i think these are common issues that we need to uh, always look at and i think that's why um, you all always have to i think we we separately record this uh, statistics as well about credit card default we actually have it in our payments bulletin as well and there is a rise i saw in the payments bulletin there has been a rise in default so these these are these are issues but, but also the economy uh, those issues are also there where, you know like last year was a bad year for a lot of people um, i think we were very lucky to be in um, uh, be in these jobs uh, but i think a lot of people had difficulty so uh, all those things together i think but but it is something very important to keep in mind thank you for that uh, and uh, then we have internet banking coming in 1994 uh, so so a lot of these a uh, lot of these payment instrument innovations come from the us um and uh, so even the so us is very very high on use of checks and that's uh, and i think the reason um, that the the thing about the payment instrument is it gives you a delayed payment right when it gives you a slight float to to sort of manage your funds and i think us being the sort of the more free market that it is these sort of payment instruments are very important to to make the economy constantly uh, sort of go forward and that's why you know from the 1800 like late 1800s they started uh, issuing charge cards and 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 sort of not credit cards as they were but is giving my uh, uh, transacting on credit so um and and having intermediary services uh, american express is one of those uh, services that provided interme uh, intermediation service with credit so um a lot we find that a lot of these and to this day actually these innovations keep coming from um uh from um the us and and uh, they also pick up really fast um because uh, i actually i think so the 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 innovation itself or the invention comes from other countries but the us because it has a very free market um they you, they can really implement it and it becomes very successful um so in sri lanka in 1997 we had the debit cards coming in um as you know credit cards and debit cards have a slightly different system because debit cards directly access the bank account um then in 1998 so this is very so 1998 the launch of paypal so the launch of paypal is a very significant historic event and um to this day no one no other uh payment app has been able to beat paypal right um pre previous to paypal there have been similar digital wallets um that have been created but paypal was the one that really took off and it survived the dot com bubble in 2000 and it and when a lot of the others um, crashed paypal managed to survive and and i think it's uh because it was one of the few surviving it really gained the market um it, like internationally it is leading so and it has become the sort of the poster child for mobile payment applications and digital wallets so it's a very significant it's a very significant event actually because it it is the it is the sort of the launching pad for uh, what, what we call fintech today and then uh in sri lanka uh, in 1994 uh, internet banking was introduced in the states in the first in the world and in 1999 internet banking is introduced in uh, sri lanka uh then we fast forward to 2005 which is mpesa being launched in kenya so this is mobile money and again this is very significant um for people in the bottom of the pyramid uh, group and it also brought in telecom operators into um into the payment uh, space where they were able to provide a technology uh to reach out to a, a group of customers that banks 
uh, who are traditionally uh, those in charge of uh, service and payment requirements in a society, um, the telcos, because they had uh, the telecom network and the, the the mobile network, they were able to come in to this industry. Uh, and then we see slowly the mobile phone coming into payments, right? So all this time, online transfers, um, internet banking, they were all computer-based, right? We see from the 2000s with phone networks, with, with phones being sort of more um, popular and not more people having phones. So M-Pesa is not a smartphone, it is a feature phone. Um, we, we see how the mobile phone, as it, as it changes, how it also comes into the payments industry. So the, the mobile phone is not a technology that was there in the payment industry, but the technology that we were having were card, the card technology, right? So that was the infrastructure, so to speak, that uh, the retail customer was getting, right? So now the retail customer had another instrument Right, that that the retail retail customer had um, invested in. Right, like all this time banks couldn't invest, give everyone something like the 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 phone. Right, it's too expensive. But people started buying their own phones. So suddenly now banks also had an access point um, to to uh, deliver digital uh, products without outside the card. And then 2008 was the global financial crisis, another very, very important event for retail payments. Because what happened in the global financial crisis, and I will discuss this further when we discuss um, FinTech towards the end of the course, which is that um, people lost faith in the banking industry, uh, especially in the West, because that's where it was really affected. And all, so, people had all their money in the banks and they, most of them lost their money. So suddenly the bank was not the be all and end all for financial services. And they started seeking alternatives. And at the same time, uh, the iPhone had been launched. Um, there were alternative technologies. So, and a lot of bankers lost their jobs, right? In the global financial crisis. And these bankers, uh, of needed work and they found, they were aware of the shortcomings of the system and this is particularly why it's important and going back to um, the point that we were discussing earlier of knowing how systems work right uh, global financial crisis got, uh, resulted in a case where there were a lot of people who had left the market who had a lot of understanding of how systems work the shortcomings of each system and they took that knowledge and combined it with their uh, with uh, digital technology, right? And to solve these problems, and that was the birth of the real birth of uh, fintech happened after uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis. So it's a very very important very important um, uh, event for payments in the world. Uh, it also has an impact on the main infrastructures which, which we will discuss. So, uh, because prudential requirements, uh, system security, uh, systemic risk requirements, all of those change because of the global financial crisis. So it's a very, very important event. Um, 2009, uh, there's the release of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is what are the, uh, is a virtual currency. So Bitcoin really didn't pick up in 2009, it picked up a little later, around 2013, 2014. But th this was when it was first released. And Bitcoin not just introduced the concept, really. Uh, I mean, having alternate currencies have been there historically. It's always been there. You know, you have, you have um, uh, you know, gift cards and, you know, little tokens and, you know, um, casino money. You have so many different types of little, little currencies. But Bitcoin really changed the perception of money. And this also comes in the back of the global financial crisis, right? So already people had lost faith in banks and central banks and, and there was inflation and people started 
think, oh, should we, should we, should we actually think of an alternative scenario? So as bankers, we need to remember that we can't be complacent, that people, that we are providing a service and we are providing an infrastructure. And if we don't do it properly, then there will be an alternative, that people will seek an alternative. So we have to always remember that we, we can't always think, oh, you know, we are so safe, we are, in, there's no, we are in a monopoly, so no one else can come, it's regulated. No, it's not the case, right? So we have to remember this. And I think uh, the global financial crisis and the, and the after effects of it really um, demonstrated that. Um, and then we have uh, the QR code. So more technology, uh, sorry, with Bitcoin, not only Bitcoin, it also introduced blockchain technology, which has had a huge impact on financial services. And we will discuss this later. Um, then the QR code, right? So QR codes were used in just general commerce, you know, to scan goods and, you know, make sure when they're, when they're in transit and all of that. But Alipay started using the QR code in 2011 to access uh, funds of uh, in, in digital wallets and banks. And that really changed the way uh, people pay uh, now. Uh, in Sri Lanka, mobile money was launched in 2012. So you can see that there's some time, there's a gap between 2005 and MPSA really picked up in around 2006, 2008. Um, probably, yeah, 2009, that time. And it took time uh, for it to be launched in Sri Lanka. And one reason is uh, that it's not, we are highly banked. So the market demand was less. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that pe there, are pe there, that there aren't people who uh, don't need it. Um, so, um, so it's, uh, it comes a little later and we follow a different model from the MPSA model. We'll, we'll discuss it later. Uh, 2016, uh, so this is why I said blockchain technology is important, right? The Swedish uh, central bank proposes e-krona, which is a digital central bank currency, right? Um, so they use, so they use the same technology as Bitcoin, but for central bank currency. So this is a new step that all central banks are considering, even we are also engaged in international discussions um, to see how central banks can move to digital currency. And in 2018, uh, we launched the Lanka QR, which is a nationalized QR standard. So you can see what the reason I put the two next to each other is, you can see how Sri Lanka follows relatively closely, closer now with 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 time we are we are more closer to adopting international uh, uh trends and international developments in terms of um, advancing our payments so that's why i put the two together so that you can see um, how it uh, moves right so any questions so far any questions so far Any points that you'd like to raise or add uh, to this, to what I said? Right, so let's go into sort of the bigger topic that we've been discussing, which is dig digitalization of payments and settlements. So we can see this in two phases. Uh, one is, one is, the digitalization of backend operations, right? And I think we have people who have been involved in that. A um, lot of the banks historically, do I have a slide on that? I can just speak on it. Right, okay, so I will speak on this. So we have backend and front end processes, right? And what we saw, like in the timeline, what I didn't discuss and what we will discuss in the subsequent um, subsequent uh, lectures is how there was a how there was a how there was an emphasis on digitalizing backend operations, the co-banking, right? 
and what we're seeing now, right? If you take, go back to this timeline, right? So from 1967 up to 1998, so for about 30 years, there are no significant innovations or uh, additions to retail payments, right? And if we look at this concurrent period in banks, they had systems coming into place for database management, uh, accounting systems, um, clearing systems. In 1973, SWIFT was introduced. Um, so a lot of the digitalization happened in the back end, right? And um, this, the, the reason that it happened in the back end was what I talked about the infrastructure, right? How can, how you can't just digitalize, you need infrastructure to di di digitalize. And it was, Banks, for banks, it made sense to invest in systems. They had the money to invest and they had the need to invest because they, it was giving them a lot of efficiencies. It was saving a lot of costs. Um, it was easy for them to audit. And so banks were moving their backend systems and for management, right? For most of these systems are management information systems. So, so that about those three decades and we will see that in Sri Lanka that probably stretches to a fourth decade and so your banks may have really gone through introducing new co-banking systems like digitalizing processes in the 90s and 2000s am I am I correct if I say that that most of the co-banking systems were started getting um, introduced 80s, 90s, early 2000s in Sri Lanka. Yes, somewhere around that uh, late 90s. Yeah, because that was when it started making sense. And that's why we have 1999, the introduction of internet banking. Um, so that was, that was when it, it was required, our, our, our industry was expanding, the demand was expanding, and it started making sense uh, to make those investments. Until that time, going staying manual was fine, right? For a long time, Central Bank was, I think, the place with the few computers. Um, so uh, moving to that, uh, moving to digitalization is not purely, again, as I said, not only efficiency, there are a lot of other reasons, uh, and in this case, uh, digitalizing the back end internationally, digitalizing the back end made sense because banks could invest in the infrastructures and people were okay. I mean, their, their economic activity was basic enough. They, they could live with cash and checks and the cards, right? That was sufficient for them. Um, and what we see is that the cards evolved to enable internet payments, e-commerce, right? Uh, so for a long time, it didn't, it didn't need to change. And, and we need to understand that when we are adopting systems, that it is not just because the system is there, we have to adopt. We have to make, make, make a proper decision. Is it worth our while? Is it worth the cost? Uh, is there going to be a market for this? So when we're making investments, it's really important to um, consider all these uh, places, uh, aspects, and it's also, and sometimes you find that the regulator asks the system, uh, asks the banks to come in, and that is because of the network. You need a network. Just one person introducing, uh, 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 let's say, a payment app, that doesn't make sense. It, it only makes sense when everyone joins in. So there are many aspects that come into this. So what we find is now, the emphasis on the front end, right? So we have more, and so these are all front end payment instruments, right? And that's why this course is sort of uh, focusing a lot on this because now the innovations are front end innovations. And a lot of the back end innovations are becoming simplified. And I think that's why there was a, there was a sort of a, uh, 
not so happy remark about how new junior officers don't know what's going on and that's because the systems have now been advanced they don't need to learn uh, what's going on and they will probably know more about apps and and things like that um so we also we can also separate this as large value and corporate payments and individual payments so uh, while the back end processes were digitalized we also saw that the first set of payments that were given priority for digitalization were the large value and the corporate payments so we have uh, rtgs we have slips it's only afterwards that now we have sefs uh, and uh, just pay and all that so again it goes back to the question of cost right these are the realities of i mean these are the harsh realities of the world it goes back to costs and so you need to recover your cost of investment so um banks will focus on investing in the systems that they can also earn money from right so most of the rtgs payments are corporate payments and and related um money market payments and securities payments so uh these are the realities that we and i think most of you already probably know this uh that it comes down to the the rupees and cents uh sort of <laughs> no pun intended there um so yeah let's let's go into the details and i really want you to engage with me here and the reason this might sound basic to some of you but i don't know whether there are people who need uh this level of uh, description so that's why i'm going into sort of basics and also again i i like going back to basics because when we miss the basics and we just talk about the instrument it it creates problems later on and and this is something we see quite often uh when people in in these areas they they think they can leap because you can leap from the um technology but it doesn't help if you leap frog the knowledge because uh, you have sort of um, some missing links that if things go wrong you can't kind of, kind of backtrack um any questions up to this point no okay so i think all of us know uh, what a payment card is um so it a payment card basically the point of the payment card is access right it is to access funds now that is what makes it a payment instrument now how, that is how it diff, that is that is why it's called a payment instrument without any issue because it is providing an interface to access the funds that are either held in a bank account or digital wallet or wherever it is it is a point of access right so um and uh, we have generally there are four types of uh, payment cards um, which is the debit card and the stored value cards credit cards and charge cards we don't have charge cards in sri lanka and such but char char charge cards are very popular in the us um and if i'm not mistaken charge cards function where you have to you don't get credit you have to pay at the end of at, at a given point you have to pay uh, this, there is no credit involved uh, so because a credit card functions as a loan um so sri lanka has four international card schemes the visa master amex and jcb and he also launched the national card scheme in 2019 um i will discuss the card, national card scheme as we go uh but the importance of uh, card schemes uh, is there anyone who um uh, has everyone been involved in cards uh, in their time at the banks if is there anyone who hasn't been exposed to cards i mean not using cards or having but the system the, the back end systems and uh, all that so i yeah got involved in evaluation of cards and issuing mm -hmm. but not the operational level and sorry i can't see who stalking because my the screen takes my for for who was that 
Okay, this is Hasela. Uh, ah, yes, Diane uh, Philander, yes, yes, also yes, known yes. as Hasela. Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so I was involved in uh, evaluating an issuance of cars, but not on the back end operations. Right, right. Others? Uh, others with experience in cards? Right. So um, cards, there are sort of several aspects and we can, so when we talk about the regulatory aspect also and the infrastructure, we can go into detail about the card infrastructures um, because it has the issue, it has different uh, participants. It has the issuer, which is the bank that issues. And then you have the card scheme is the one who provides the infrastructure, right? To within milliseconds to get the message back saying, hey, this person has enough money in their account to, to honor this payment, right? Uh, and card schemes also determine fees and, and fees is, is, is very important. And actually it is around, the card, uh, how how the card market uh, determines the fees that much of the theories uh, emerged from and actually even a Nobel Prize was won from that, how card schemes determine fees. So it's it's a it's 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 a market of its own. And, and it's very important that we understand uh, how payment cards work. Uh, though they though they're sort of very humbly sitting in our wallets, they actually have a lot going on there so and uh, so let's proceed so uh, sorry it's 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 a very uh, it's a very um, full uh, full slide i'm sorry about that um so we'll first start with debit cards uh, so the ecb defines that is the european central bank defines a debit card as a card enabling its holder to make purchases and or withdraw cash and have these transactions directly and immediately to charge to their accounts. And that is the main defining factor. We all know this, right? It, it, we are di directly, it directly hits our bank account. Um, whether these are held with the card issue or not. So which means now we are talking about the common switch where we can um, access money from other banks, right? Um, so today's debit card users often have choices of authorizing. Now, now when we go to the card itself, right? So this is, it's, we all know it's not just a card. So this authorization is very important. And, and as bankers and people who work in branches, you know, you have the signature cards. So the mandate is, is rests on authorization, right? So, uh, so today's cards have, uh, the pin the signature and now we even have contactless right um so while the choice often makes no difference to the con consumer it makes a great deal of difference to the merchant and the transaction processors um and this comes down to cost because if it goes from the pin transaction it goes to a separate system and it goes through the signature it carries different fees so these are all sort of very important um now in the UK, they made it mandatory to have chip and pin a few years ago. Um, and in Sri Lanka, we don't have chip and pin. We have chip and signature. We've made, uh, we've not made EA, uh, the chip compulsory, but we put the onus, if there is a fraud or any, any issue, the onus goes to the party that doesn't have EMB technology. So um, Therefore, uh, basically, banks all have uh, chip and pin. I think all of your banks have the chip, right? In your cards. Yeah. Do all of your banks, I know um, Bank of Ceylon does, HNB does, um, Pan Asia? The chip is this. I think Diaparan is from Pan Asia, right? No, I can't hear. So let's. Um, so uh, let's. So basically, that's the uh, 
the rule and we'll discuss this when we are discussing the legal aspects um so uh the because of the increased security standards uh, there is uh, increased uh, contactless payments now um and uh, debit cards can be used in post and internet or uh, base payments but of course not all banks in sri lanka um so i had taken it for granted a very interesting experience for me i had taken so my bank had a debit card uh, it had enabled debit card for internet payments so i even uh, for, for a long time and um, i lived with that idea that all debit cards had the same uh, power uh, it was much later that i realized that some banks had not because of the risk because it directly accesses uh, Uh, the bank account some some banks delayed in in enabling uh, access for debit cards um, any of you had that experience where the debit card was not able to access internet uh, was not able to um, execute internet based payments actually currently also we are not uh, with a limit only we are operating uh, yeah. so maybe a basic limit like 100 to Hundred fifty thousand. So This more, is, uh, majority of the uh, transactions are a sale. A sale, okay. The the sorry, a sale. You are from which bank? Sorry. NTB. NTB, right. Trust. Right. Uh, so, so you have upper account. limit. Yeah, yeah. And the credit card doesn't. No credit cards. Uh, there's no limit for that. Except for the for, for the credit limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, any others? Where you have, do do you find that uh, your customers use a lot? I don't know whether you're aware of this uh, data, or whether your customers use uh, debit cards for online transactions. the demand for uh... right um i i think i have that data i'll i'll pick it pick it up and uh, let you all know all that um so uh, in sri lanka as i said 1997 was when we uh, introduced the debit cards and uh, right now uh, we have 18 lcbs and uh, this is third quarter 2020 data which is the latest data we have um and three licensed specialized banks and 11 finance companies are all licensed to issue debit cards and we will discuss um in the subsequent lectures the 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 approvals that are required to be able to issue debit cards so this is a sort of a stylized uh, debit card process um so um uh, you access through the terminal right um and uh, this is a post payment um and then the customer approves or or customer's bank approves or declines uh, the transaction um and then uh, this is sent back so these things happen in very few seconds and this is why the card card schemes Uh, come in and they spend a lot of money in to ensure the speed and the security of all these transactions and that is part of the reason why they charge um and then the merchant sends the transaction ultimately to be settled right and then the funds get deposited of course uh, while the money is taken the the money is not settled real time so we'll be discussing real time settlement and deferred settlement later so um let's talk about the national card scheme and take a break and then we can come back um because this is also a debit card so we'll just complete this and then we can go to the next section um so the national how many of you are aware of the national card scheme the lanka pay card who is not aware of the lanka pay card so 
so everyone is aware of the Lanka Pika. Yes. Um, so I, I will introduce it uh, either way. Um, so the National Card Scheme, um, we launched it in 2019. It took a few years for us to get this together. Um, it's operated by Lanka Clear and um, we introduced it initially as a debit card, right? And it, it is a part of the common post switch. And we will discuss this when I'm discussing the, the CCAPS uh, infrastructure later on, once, what the common post switch is. A basic common post switch is where uh, you have one POS machine for all types of cards. So initially, you know, you will have uh, for different banks, you will have different uh, machines. For different networks, you will have different machines. But the common POS switch is it, it sort of integrates everything together, and you only need one machine. And the objective of uh, introducing the national card scheme. Uh, so the national card scheme is for rupee payments, right? So it what happens now? I think you all will know already. Some of you is that when we make a payment through a visa or a master um, or any international card scheme, that message goes out of Sri Lanka and comes back. So it goes, it hits the international visa master uh, central systems and does all the fraud checks, you know, if all the checks happens there, the AML checks, um, and then it comes back. So that, the point where it leaves the country we have to pay foreign exchange, right? So increasingly countries are introducing national card schemes for, for their local currencies, because for a rupee payment, uh, for an internal rupee payment, we end up spending money, we end up spending foreign exchange, right? So um, that is the main reason for going into a national card scheme. And that way this is, this becomes similar to any internal, um, payment, uh, local currency payment, right? Um, and there were many, many objectives. Uh, one was, of course, cash uh, management cost, which is to reduce cash. Uh, uh, and then we have the payment information remains in Sri Lanka. And uh, this is all for sort of a prepaid card for distributed social securities. This is also, we're also discussing uh, integrating this with uh, the transit card, right? Because it's going from the LKR system. And because it's not going abroad, uh, the merchant uh, charges are reduced. And then, of course, what I said, the foreign exchange savings, right? Which is a major component. So um, this is how it works, right? So we have now, when we are coming up with the card, we need to make sure that people will use it and it will have acceptance because any, any payment instrument is really important that there is acceptance. Uh, otherwise the payment instrument just dies. Um, so to ensure that, that, that there is acceptance, we also in, uh, uh, joined up with an international card scheme, which is JCB, which is a Japanese card scheme. Um, it's, it, it is available like Visa Master because we saw that a lot of Sri Lankans travel abroad. A lot of people uh, now do international e-commerce. They buy things from abroad, eBay and all these places. So they need a card that has two functionalities. Otherwise they will have, they will need to have a separate Visa or MasterCard, like a normal bank card, plus the NCS, if they want to save from any of the uh, benefits that it uh, gives. So we have two legs. We have the local leg, which goes through Lanka Clear. And then we have the overseas leg, which goes through JCB, right? So the payment flow is, it will go from the messaging, uh, from the issuing bank to the Lanka Pay Network, right? And then to the acquiring bank. So in, in a normal scenario, this goes to the Visa or MasterCard or JCB, which whoever the card network is, that network. Now, instead of that, it comes to our local Lanka Clear, Lanka Pay network, right? And then the local transactions get complete. Now, the foreign transaction from Lanka Pay, so Lanka Pay will recognize whether it's a foreign transaction or not, and it will route it to JCB. 
uh, and um, it will then follow the normal process of uh, processing and a uh, foreign transaction. Uh, does any of your banks have any of your banks started to um, issue uh, the, the Lanka Pay JCP card? Do you know? Because uh, Celan and uh, MC in MCB started. Um, I'm not sure whether BOC started as well. Uh, are you aware? Not at NTB. Yeah, not at NTB. Yeah. Others? So we are waiting for this to slowly pick up because there are a lot of benefits for the banks and as well as the merchants because the the um, the rates are less, the fees is uh, fees is less. So it's um, good for them to start picking up. But of course, the thing is there is there is a lot of aggressive marketing right visa master they are, and they're not going to sit around and wait uh, for 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 their market share to be taken so as i said there are a lot of other factors when when new systems are being uh, um, introduced so uh, before we head to the next part let's take um, let's take a 50 minute break and come back in at 10:20 is that okay 10.20 there? Okay. So I will see you at 10.20. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> uh, welcome back. So let's start now. Um, so I just want to uh, let you know that... Um, when you're, uh, if you want, I can make the uh, the the lectures more advanced or make it uh, simpler. So, uh, tell me how you want to, uh, what the level is. If is is this level okay, or would you like it to be more advanced? Because the the reason I'm saying is because I. This is what I do. So I, I, I work in the payments and settlements department in the policy division. So this is what we do when I research a lot on uh, payments and fintech. So I can make this as advanced as you want or simpler. So if this level is okay, let me know. If not, I can uh, sort of uh, bring in more theory and, and have, a, have a sort of a more advanced uh, discussion. So let me know what you uh, think. because I know that different people are coming from different backgrounds. So they will, sometimes we think, oh, everyone knows everything, but sometimes they actually don't, though even though they've been in banks. Uh, but sometimes you might know this area very well. So let me know where you want me to um, pitch this and I can um, sort of adjust accordingly. It's not a problem. Right. Um, so um, shall we uh, resume to the presentation? So let me just. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Right, thank you. Um, so, um, this is uh, anyone here with a credit card uh, background uh, who's working in credit cards? Uh, Isivara or I think Budhima is also here. That you know, I think you were not there before. Do you have any credit card experience at the banks? Working uh, with the credit card uh, evaluation or back end systems, anything like that? Okay, so I will I will continue as is. Um, so a credit card differs from uh, the now. The thing is, what we need to understand is we are not. Uh, this is not about what is a credit card per se. This is basically 
what purpose is it serving in the, in the larger frame of things and um, so it's not just what is a credit card but why is that why are there credit cards what's their purpose uh, can they be left behind can they be discarded um, so we have to look at when we are looking at it from an executive level we shouldn't just be looking at okay what is the instrument um, but what is the purpose of the instrument why is it there can what aspects of it is useful what aspects do we need to let go what aspects can we combine with other technologies and improve uh, the instrument so a credit card uh, so the uh, yes, european central bank uh, definition uh, for a credit card is that it enables card holders to make purchases or withdraw cash uh, to a pre-arranged credit limit so this is very important that a um, lot of people we see nowadays don't understand what a credit card is that there is a it's a loan at the end of the day and a lot of people forget this and they act like it is a bank balance it is not it is a loan and there is a limit to it so you can't um, be extending it or adding you can't add back add to credit um uh, and give cash back and things um so credit granted may either be settled in full by the end of a specified period or settled in part with the balance taken as extended credit now this is the difference between a charge card and a credit card you get to take forward your credit right and so this is a very credit card is a very interesting concept because um it is not just a payment instrument right it is giving you a loan it is basically letting you pay on loan right so instead of you having to um take a loan and then withdraw money from the bank account this is sort of pay as you sorry uh, return as you spend sort of uh, credit so it's a very interesting uh, concept and um, and it 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 gives a lot of versatility to the economy because we are, because we take economy very fast by the bit and it facilitates uh transactions right because if people don't have money to pay uh people don't buy right and so that, that stops the entire flow it's understood that people don't have, get all the money that they want to spend for a, in any one period so the 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 monetary system that we work with right the economic uh the sort of market based economy that all our countries in most of the world runs on this um so having a facility like credit cards is very important for the sort of fluid functioning of an economy so that people can go for credit cards uh, go for, go for, go and make their purchases despite not having the money at the same time but of course this has its risks right like people default Uh, beyond their means, but it, it serves a very, very fundamental function in the economy, right? At a retail level. So these are not housing loans or things like that. These are for small purposes, right? So credit cards are only for retail purposes. Um, so it's very important to appreciate why this instrument came about, right? The instrument. is there we know what it does but why it came about is because for the smooth functioning of economic activity people sometimes need more money than they have in their first wallet or bank account and that, 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 this is why it emerged from the us uh, at the time um, after the american civil war there was a lot of economic activity so they needed this credit they needed a, an intermediary to give this guarantee that i will pay on this person's behalf and people have to honor that as well right so the credit card system does not work if we don't pay so we have to repay it also on time so if we don't then our card gets blocked so this this whole 
whole system has to work. Everyone join and play the game properly. Otherwise, it doesn't. Uh, if, if people just take credit and don't pay, it doesn't work. Uh, or um, and if they don't use the credit card at all, also then this doesn't work, right? So it, it's very important in, in advanced economies we see that. Uh, so the credit a card in Sri Lanka was introduced in 89. Um, so people can obtain cash advances on their credit. Now we've used the word cash advance, right? And not withdraw cash, right? Now this is, the central bank writes it as we, you know, cash advance. Do we call it a cash advance? Can someone tell me? Anyone? So it's an advance because this is a loan. Right, an advance loan. So people should remember that when they withdraw money from the credit card, that they are not withdrawing their own money, that they are not accessing their bank account, increasing their debt. They need to understand that, and this is very, very important, right? Um, and this is give rewards to credit cards, like in the not not rewards. So you can't put in extra money in a credit card. What you're giving is a loan, right? You can give cash back for defaulted uh, payments, but you can't, the, the bank can't say here, oh, here we are giving you 10,000 in cash and we are putting 10,000 cash into your, uh, we are increasing uh, your credit. Uh, sorry, that sometimes we find that people want to treat it like a stored value card and not a credit card. So. There is a fine balance there. So we need to understand that this is a loan, right? Um, so we find that with the increase of um, cross-border uh, cross e-commerce, that there are more and more arrangements that uh, allow us to use credit cards both locally and abroad, even in ATMs. And in Sri Lanka, 14 commercial banks have been licensed to uh, issue credit cards and there are three finance companies as well, right? Um, there are a lot more actors. Again, there are credit cards also from the international card schemes. Um, and there are acquirers, there are post machine providers. There are, I mean, it's there, there's a huge ecosystem and the infrastructure we'll discuss when we're discussing infrastructure at large. So what I want to discuss here is the credit versus debit card usage in Sri Lanka. And um, what we are seeing is, so if you take the volumes, right? What you need to look at is these two, the axis, right? You can see that the credit card volumes and values are both higher. Of course, in the recent, last year, they have sort of changed. We can see a change here. They're both similar. But overall, credit cards are going at a higher level. There is more volume and value transactions from, uh, sorry, there's more value transactions, the higher value transactions from credit cards, right? If you want to go to, uh, go to the original source, you can go to the payments uh, bulletin here. Um, and if we go to the number of cards issued, again, if you look at these two axes, right? So we have um, the total number of cards is, the credit cards is far less than the debit cards. And debit cards, almost all in Sri Lanka, I think almost all, uh, is it over 16 who uh, gets the cards? Uh, Gayatri, can you uh, tell me, or the accounts, do all accounts automatically get a debit card at the Bank of Ceylon? Sangam, I couldn't get your question. Sorry? I couldn't get your question. 
uh, they have to make a request. But all uh, what are the what are the accounts that are not eligible for a debit card? Uh, no, we are uh, giving all the debit card credits for entire accounts, uh, excepting uh, the run capital accounts. It means for minor things. Except for minors, every minor yeah. can have a debit card, right? So that's why, because Sri Lanka is so banked, that's why we have a sort of high uh, total number of uh, cards. Sorry. Um, yeah, if you can switch off your microphone. Uh, that's ah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, um, so because we have, because Sri Lanka is highly banked, uh, we have a high volume of uh, debit cards because all, almost all these cards almost automatically get a debit card issued, whereas credit card uh, is, is, is slightly different. Um, so, uh, do, do we had someone who was in credit card evaluation, is he, is our sailor back, has he come? I can't see the screen. No, right? No. Um, so we have the now this is the interesting one, right? The average value per transaction, right? So we saw that there are more debit cards in Sri Lanka. Um, and when you take the total volume, that the debit cards are near the credit cards. But if we take the average value per transaction, we see a very significant difference between the two, right? Almost 10 times. Now, uh, this is an interesting aspect. That means people spend, <coughs> use the credit card, take, take credit for high, high value payments in Sri Lanka. And debit cards are used for smaller payments, smaller retail payments, right? So this is an interesting tendency in Sri Lanka that we are seeing. Uh, so a lot of these, all these cards we were just discussing before, how they are used for e-commerce. Um, now we see <clears throat> the value, the volumes have gone down in e-commerce transaction based on, because I think because of COVID mainly, uh, but still the value percentages have gone up. Uh, and this could be because of the foreign exchange uh, uh, aspect as well. Uh, and also because of COVID, because people are, people move to e-commerce transactions uh, to buy a lot of their goods, right? And then we hear, interestingly, we are seeing, of course, the base is very low, right? We are, we are working on a very low base with the debit cards. So it's seeing a significant growth. And we are, in terms of credit cards, we are seeing a decline, right? So this, I think, is the more interesting one here. Why uh, the credit card usage went down in the third quarter of... Um, there's a significant fall in terms of volume. Uh, it could be because overall consumption has gone down. And there is also a value uh, drop in the value, right? But also the problem here is debit cards are so low that uh, it, this could be just picking up the COVID uh, related transactions. It's, it's, it's a odd, so 2020 is a bit of an odd year for us to use for analysis because um, the behavior was very different. So we have to wait to see how it continues to the next year, uh, to this year, and hopefully things will normalize and um, people will, we'll have to really see whether people remain in e-commerce or whether they go back to shops and that, that, that will be uh, interesting uh, with the vaccine coming in as well. We'll have to see, we'll have to wait and see how people respond to this. Um, so stored value cards. Um, so we have 10 stored value card um, issuers in Sri Lanka. Basically, stored value card is where the card, so the debit card, we access our bank account directly. The credit card is a basically a loan from the bank. It's like a revolving loan uh, from the bank. Um, and then the travel card, sorry, the stored value card is where we get to store the value that we want. Right. So uh, 
it ends where it is it is a smaller version of a debit card because debit card will you will have access to all your bank account this will be some money that we specifically put into it a lot of stored value card are used for very specific purposes so debit cards and credit cards we can use it to who, wherever they are accepted like uh, there is on a all on a all cards rule with um, visa and mastercard so uh, they, we can widely use this but stored value cards unless they are joined with a scheme like visa master they usually they can be closed looped we have open loop and closed loop so closed loop it is with, within a certain network uh, a very common example is um, like uh, store cards you know if you go to odell or place like that they will give you uh, uh, a card right so that if it has if we can top up money or if odell is topping up money then it becomes a stored value card and then that amount is fixed but we can only use it in the odell network and whoever uh, soft logic says that you can use your odell card at but whoever other merchants were willing to accept the odell card right so this is again now we're going back to what we earlier discussed about acceptance of payment systems for payment instruments right so acceptance is very important. If people accept it, it's fine. There is value involved. So if I take my Odell points card or Sri Lankan fly smiles to a normal shop, they might they won't accept it because it, it is not of interest. Unless, of course, that person wants to buy a plane ticket somewhere, they won't buy take my fly smiles. But if they are in that they are a partner. And they and they have some arrangement with Sri Lankan Airlines, they will accept it. So and that that is a private arrangement. And un, until there is a, there are certain thresholds where you pass and you become a stored value card, the bank become a licensed entity. Uh, and if not, you you carry on right within that network. Now even in a family, we can let's say we all find let's say a particular. Um, food in our family valuable to us so within our family we can now use this food let's say it's chocolate so within our family we can use it to um, exchange goods and services right so the same way uh, so that is one extreme and the other is uh, where you store put money into it like top up like phone cards you will remember phone cards there were phone cards um, where you can buy the phone card you can pay 100 rupees and get a phone card and that card has 100 rupees that's it and once you finish speaking for what is worth 100 rupees then that's it it's, it's over so those are popular stored value cards uh, we also find that in other countries uh, stored value cards especially the one like we have here with the connected visa or mass a lot of people also have stored value cards for <clears throat> e-commerce payments because there are risks in online payments so therefore they prefer to use a stored value card because even if someone steals your card details it is only the amount that has been topped up it won't access your full bank details or your all your credit limit um, it will only have that amount that you have uh, purchased or topped up right <clears throat> now Another very common stored value card is the transit card. What that what is used in buses and trains? It's very popular in other countries. Um, and in the in the stored value card, you let's say go to a bank or you go to the store, you top it up, and then you just use it in the bus. And uh, you can use the chip and or, or whichever way that you charge the card and um then then you have the ticket issued so then you don't need to carry cash the bus conductor doesn't have to deal with cash um it can also be nfc and your payment is done and there is and when it's a stored value card the the a the kyc requirements all of them become less because you're not directly accessing customer accounts or um, you're not uh, uh, accessing any customer information as such. You can just top up a small amount 
and go and uh, keep it there. Now, the interesting thing about uh, stored value cards is in, in Sri Lanka, you have to guarantee the money, right? You can't just uh, get a li getting a license is not a, just a getting a license. It is you have to give the guarantee that when someone tops up the money, that that is kept this is safely kept by the bank and suddenly you know the money won't disappear so we generally have things like custodian uh, agreements where i'll discuss the custodian agreement with when we discuss mobile money so that uh, people the public won't lose their money just by putting into into a stored value card because imagine uh, you put it into a stored value card and then the person operating the stored value card just uh the just disappears or something like that. Uh, so then the person should be able to get the money back. So there are certain safeguards that come into um, issuing these cards, especially stored value cards. Um, so internet-based payments, I discussed this at the beginning, which is uh, which is uh, what we generally call internet-based payments is internet banking and uh, so which allows customers to access uh, banking services through the internet and this was initially introduced in 1999 um so generally what we find is that the banks offer services like customer account information uh, applying or subscribing for financial products like fds or um there are several other services i think uh, do you know the services that your banks offer uh, from internet banking other than opening FDs? So, um, Internet banking is very important. We will be discussing something called open banking later onwards when we're discussing the fintech section. So at this point, all that is here becomes very important. This account information, applying for financial products, uh, performing own account or third party fund transfers, all those things become important when we're discussing fintech. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we are seeing that financial transaction based on internet banking is increasing. The volume is increasing, I think, partly because of COVID. COVID might have a very, very uh, high reason for this increase. But in terms of value, we are seeing a decrease. But this might be because of the overall economic activity going down. <clears throat> okay, so now we are coming to mobile money. It's also e-money. So mobile money is a, is a mobile, ba mobile payment system based on accounts held by a mobile operator. Uh, and accessible from the subscriber's mobile phone. Now, this is what is commonly known as uh, mobile money, right? And then there's a conversion of cash into electronic value. So what happens is they go they go to the shop, uh, to the mobile money agent, and then they say, okay, here's 100 rupees. Can you please put it, up, put it into my mobile money account? And then that uh, the, car, the agent has a system to, uh, to put it into the the person's mobile money account and then they get e-money right so uh in the distinctive fact about mobile money is that uh, the authorization uh, is via sms right uh, in sri lanka we have two systems one is the customer account based mobile payments that is if you have the this is for the banks right so where the banks uh, have customers obviously with accounts, uh, they can access their accounts through their phone, right? And then you have mobile money, e-money uh, e systems, which is dialogue, uh, easy cash and mcash, right? So uh, this is, as I said, mentioned earlier, is where the telcos, the telecommunication companies came in to providing payment services and access to non-cash payment or non-paper based payments, right? So even if you don't have a smartphone, even if you can't get to a bank ATM, using mobile money, uh, they can uh, use digital uh, e-money, right? So the Sri Lankan 
the Sri Lankan um, model, now in if you take the Kenyan model, the Kenyan model, they gave the license to the telco, to Safaricom and Vodafone. Um, and they are the people who are directly issuing the e-money. But in Sri Lanka, we came up with the custodian account uh, model, right? So service providers should open and maintain a custodian account with the licensed commercial bank, which is um, uh, that the service provider is the telco. So the telco can't, the telco gets a license to issue e-money, but they can't just start, they can't collect the customer funds itself. The customer funds should be deposited with a bank, right? So this is to ensure the safety of public funds, right? Now, the central bank and the banks and the finance companies are those who are directly regulated by the central bank, right? Telcos are not directly regulated under the central bank. They are directly regulated by the TRC. For this uh, mobile money component, they are regulated by us, but we have a bigger hold on the banks and the banks have systems in place to ensure that public funds are safe, right? And they are, because they have to adhere to much stringent prudential requirements as well. So therefore we have the custodian agreement where let's say the cumulative sum of all the balances of all the uh, customers, right? Let's say uh, uh, Nimal has 500, uh, uh, Gayatri has 300 and Pradeep has 200. So all that now easy cash and M cash, we'll see that now. Now that same amount must be reflected in the custodian account in their in their custodian bank. So in case something happens to dialog or mobitel, the customer funds are safe, right? Um, so we have what is called the trust arrangement to ensure the customer protection in case of a bankruptcy of the service provider, right? So if something happens because Dialogue is the one who's, uh, Dialogue and Mobitel are the ones who are uh, moving the money, but the money is 100% guaranteed through the custodian agreement. That is the safekeeping that we have, right? Because uh, the way we, our, our priority in, in our regulations is first safety of public funds and then connected to that is financial system stability, right? So people can't, we, we have to ensure that people don't lose their funds when they're trying to use electronic payments or digital payments, right? So um, mobile wallets and, un, uh, and the unbanked. Now, Basically, these, as I said earlier as well, was introduced in countries where they didn't have um, banks for miles and miles and miles. So if you take India, still the, about 191 million people are unbanked. They don't have access to banks, right? So when they don't have access to banks, this mobile money system becomes very, very sensible and useful because Otherwise, they don't have ways of remitting money across long distances. And these countries, then if you take Kenya, Uganda, India, they are b b huge countries, even Philippines. And they have a lot of remittances. Now, remittances within the country as well. So in Sri Lanka, there are internal remittances, domestic remittances, but a lot of people use the banking system. I mean, those uh, countries, Financial inclusion is low, so they need this alternative. So the cheap uh, feature phone can do the job, right? And it's, but in Sri Lanka also, it is used for remittances as well. Um, and uh, if we take the process that we took, the custodian account process, um, when we introduced the mobile money in Sri Lanka, it was we had to become innovative the regulator had to become innovative because the the mpesa model didn't suit sri lanka the giving the telecom operator the main responsibility didn't suit sri lanka so there was a very uh, there was a good collaboration with the regulators and the service providers uh, where everyone came together to make sure that 
this is successful and it doesn't uh, adversely affect any of the the principles in payment safety that we adhere to that central bank and then the banks adhere to that that is not compromise so this is not a point that you can compromise it uh, of course these are small values you have to remember that these are not bank accounts so these are very small value uh, accounts and used for very small retail payments um so uh, this can create different types of issues as gayatri initially mentioned because of the 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 the, uh, the smaller values it can it can create un unintended circumstances um so for the success of uh, the, the in the harvard business review sri lanka was also cited uh, for mobile money ventures and in that article the lessons was one was work well with regulators and then to keep the service free as possible and then getting in agents on board right so this is something on the theoretical side um, which we will discuss at the end and see whether we want to discuss it further in the next session um, and then uh, make customer registrations easy and earn consumer trust in any payment instrument any payment instrument earning customer trust that is when the customer uses the payment the money should go to the other party at on the correct day and the correct value should go otherwise people won't go but imagine if we use a credit card to pay and then the merchant says hey i didn't get 100 rupees i only got 75 rupees then it becomes a problem right so um uh, earning con consumer trust is very very important uh, and of course keeping the product as simple as possible if it's to any 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 this goes to any product like even mobile apps like uh, if a good example is if you have brought, bought things online um, you will see that after you've selected everything if the payment point is too complex you know they're saying I'll give me these details and these details now you know check this and you know and again and, and again finally you give up paying and you just leave and that is very very common they actually have uh, statistics and analysis or e-commerce sites like ebay and all of that uh, about uh, customers completing the transaction right so these are very important uh, to keep the product simple are there any questions up to this point Any questions? Okay, then I will proceed. Right, so because we have uh, only two e-money systems in Sri Lanka. We don't uh, release the values and volumes, but we can see that uh, most of it are used for utility payments. So mobile payments, have, it has advanced. So it is not just for transferring money from one person to the other. It allows a lot of uh, alternate payment types, right? For purchasing um, utility payments um, to pay institutions. So we can see that it is the use um that there's a high usage for utility payments right this is this is the sort of convenience that we are talking about where once you start using these that people these mundane payments you know like the other day i was at cargill's and there was a couple and they had bought about I don't know about 10 bills, you know, light bills and water bills and uh, tele mobile phone bills. And they were taking up a lot of time at the, at the counter and people, and it was after a long time I was seeing this. I mean, there was a time when it was, you know, in 2019 or so it was quite common, but I think with COVID and everyone being at home, people start to find alternative ways of paying. 
and this was very it really stuck out and there was a huge queue for me and um, so i actually told the husband i said why don't you pay online because it was taking such a long time uh, so likewise we see that and that was actually a rare sight because i, I hadn't seen that happening in a long time um, and uh, i think now when people have the option of um, have the option of um, paying online uh, or through their digital money they they are moving to that so in sri lanka we will find that this is less because there is internet banking right um, and uh, but globally uh, mobile money is quite popular in developing countries right so we will see that that there are now about 1 billion more than 1 billion registered uh, accounts globally right and in south asia 315 million and it has gone up by 10% right and active accounts have gone up by 6% right so the transaction volume is 7.3 billion so that's quite a lot if you take globally it's 37.1 so we so where is the highest we have yeah we have uh, sub saharan africa where there is uganda kenya a lot of well, there is a lot of unbanked people it's we can see it's very very popular 23.8 billion in um sub saharan africa uh so this is from the gsma uh, 2019 report um and here we can see again in sub saharan africa 690 billion and then of which 456 billion is from sub saharan africa and then again a very high number from south asia as well uh, 125.4 billion right so it's it's the rise is um 16% increase so it's it's catching up and it's becoming more and more popular and what we're finding is that uh, in, if you read the gsma report you will find that mobile what i what i mentioned earlier which we see sri lanka as well it is not just a money transfer system it is giving people more services like utility payments institutional payments so as as new and more services come into that just like our mobile apps people will if they are already using the mobile money service they will just continue using that and transferring their money from there right so th this is a important point where uh, payment instruments are or payment systems are not just single purpose they are multi purpose now if you take even the credit card and debit card we can pay with it in multiple channels we can pay it on the post we can pay it in the internet um in worst case if we if there's no connecting machine you can even write down the numbers and pay right so it's very versatile and that given that multiple option is really what 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 uh, ensures that it is successful uh now we go to mobile apps right so mobile apps um we know that there has been an increase in mobile apps globally mainly due to the rise in e-commerce right because we are moving we are becoming digital beings we we prefer to uh, not go shopping when we try to shop as much as possible online and with things like covid it is increasing um now if you take if i take myself personally now almost everything i buy online clothes everything i buy online um and um i i used to live abroad and even there uh, and this is some time ago there also we used to buy everything online so when once you get used to it and once the infrastructure is in place like the delivery and all of that is in place automatically people move to that because there are a lot of conveniences and you realize that you sometimes might be spending unnecessary amounts of your life time on purchasing very mundane things like groceries or you know like normal clothes that you may know the size and the pattern and everything for um so and utility bills like why waste time paying utility bills so so uh, people uh, have been moving to apps and also from the merchant side having now here we can see that here the merchants there are many merchants that have apps burger king dunkin donuts 
star, Starbucks, right? These are all merchant level. The merchant also can collect a lot of data, right? And they can give points and discounts when and, and they can really keep the customer to themselves through using the facilities of a mobile app. So there are two advantages. Now, even if you take any other mobile app, if you have mobile app on your phone, you will see now from the mobile app, they will they see your purchase and then they start sending you messages. Ah, here you can get a discount here. I'm giving you some extra points for being such a good customer. So there, there are a lot of alternative ways that you can grasp the customer. So and keep the customer with you because what is important is you need to have a sufficient mass of customers uh, otherwise your mobile app doesn't work because all from each payment you are getting a very small percentage right and mobile apps what they fundamentally do is they provide an interface just like the debit card or the credit card they provide an interface right so uh now debit card gives you an in a connection to the um, bank account the mobile app also can do the same thing it can you can either include your debit uh, debit card or your credit card into the mobile app to then get a so you don't need to carry your mobile card uh, sorry your credit card all the time you can just once you insert it you can use it or you can directly connect your bank account now either ways it is giving an interface to your funds right and um And, and as I said, it is giving you an inter interface to your funds. So this is really the crux of a mobile app. So we, when we are thinking of mobile apps, we shouldn't sort of, um, you know, think, oh my God, what is this? It's so complicated, so advanced. We must understand, okay, what is the crux of it? Then mobile apps function as digital wallets. They have a wallet component, right? They basically a digital wallet is like a bank account right so if you open a freemi uh, if you get a freemi app basically ntv comes and opens a freemi account right it is called digital wallet but it is an account it's functionally an account so and then you keep topping up that account you will pull money from your other bank or whatever but you will keep on topping up uh, uh, your bank account your new bank account which is directly connected to your mobile app so we must then the all these all these uh, responsibilities and obligations of a payment service provider in protecting the public funds starts to hit it right so that is very important uh, so in uh, most if you're just a payment service provider you can't just hold money that's when the custodian agreement uh, custodian account uh, matter comes in because what distinguishes between a financial institution that is a bank or a non-financial institution and a payment service provider is a payment service provider can't hold public funds they can only provide the transference of the funds right so if you are going to hold money in your digital wallet then you those all those prudential requirements hit you that's why banks find it very easy because they already are banks and they can have accounts right so uh, in Sri Lanka, if you are going to hold money in a digital wallet, you have different um, regulatory requirements to comply with, right? <coughs> now, the reason I put this, this is all international apps. Actually, none of them are available in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have Alipay here. We have Alipay uh, in Sri Lanka. Alipay is not in this picture. Western Union is there in Sri Lanka. Gram is there. So there are a few. Oh, sorry, Uber is also there. Uber has a, in Sri Lanka, it, we use the card, so it's not a big problem. In, in, but in Europe and all of that, they actually have a license as a payment service provider. Uh, and uh, though we have Google in Sri Lanka, we don't have uh, Google Wallet here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there are so, the reason I put this picture here is because there are so many. Right? It is not one, it is not a few. There are so many mobile payment apps in the world. And even in Sri Lanka, there are quite a few. Um, are there any questions on this?
Okay, if there are no questions, I will move to the next one. So then we have another innovation that has come through technology in accepting payments, right? Another interface, another payment instrument, which is the QR code. Now the QR code is an alternative channel to accepting payments and connecting the customer and the merchant, right? So it's again an interface. So, so when now one thing that I'm constantly saying the word interface. So payment instruments are interfaces and really important as bankers to understand this, right? A lot of people we find that they 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 miss this point, right? They are they are so um, involved in making like interesting payment apps and all of that, they have forgotten that it this is this has a very clear purpose, right? So understanding that clear purpose is very important. Uh, so, uh, an important feature of the QR code is that it can, as opposed to a barcode, is that it can store large volumes of data and you can, and it's also very versatile, it's very easy to use in the sense uh, you don't need uh, uh, a, a, a big infrastructure requirement, like the merchant can just have a paper with the QR code uh, scanned and you can scan it with your phone, right? Um, and uh, QR, uh, it, it's quite um, resilient. Like you, it, even if it's damaged, you can still use it. Uh, and it's safer as it can be uh, encrypted. Um, so there are a few ways of the, the QR code can be scanned. That is from the smartphone, you scan the QR code, uh, the business QR code, or the business can scan your QR code, right? Or app to app, you can receive. Uh, now I will show a small video. Uh, because uh, this is a video in China, because QR codes are really popular in uh, uh, China. So, we should just go in the rest of the world. So um, what we saw was, so China is a really a sort of like M-Pesa in Kenya, QR code was, uh, the success of QR code was really seen in China, um, where they leapfrog because again, China was also an underbanked country. They didn't, uh, mobile payments didn't, uh, the M-Pesa style didn't work there, uh, but because they were sort of becoming technologically advanced increasingly and more people had because china themselves has makes a lot of phones uh people had access to a smartphone so they could move to qr codes very fast and they use it everywhere and this has been the case from about 2016 or so and uh, because alipay uh, um, alipay and tencent adopted qr that point so when a, when a major player adopts a payment instrument it 
it really takes off, right? That is one way for a payment instrument take off. Um, so finding that point where everyone will use it is 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 really important. And and with those two large payment service pro providers taking on QR code, it really blew up. And as the video showed, it's more than 50 times more than in the the use of the value use is more than 50 times in the us so it's it's phenomenal the use of qr code um, in china and and subsequently we have seen in um, other countries uh, in india in sri lanka we have in introduced standardized qr codes so that everyone can because there are so many benefits involved in uh, using qr so uh, as I said, in Sri Lanka, we also recognize this, um, the, the, you, the benefits that QR could give uh, the people. And we introduced uh, the Lanka QR um, code. And this is an EMV uh, QR code, which means it has the security features of the EMV code standard, and it also becomes interoperable. So, it beca it's, so Lanka QR basically is a standard, right? So, at the, People can have different, different, uh, different, different QR codes. Um, and then, in that case, what happens is, if you go to a shop, you will have, you know, five different, ten different QR codes issued by each bank. But because all the banks and all the payment service providers who are issuing QR codes are following Lanka QR code, they only have to have a single QR code. So, shop doesn't if it has a Lanka QR logo. It doesn't need to have multiple Lanka QR logos. It just needs one. It doesn't matter which bank or payment service provider has issued it. If it's Lanka QR, then any Lanka QR uh, payment could be made through uh, that single QR code, right? Um, so uh, Lanka, uh, Lanka QR was launched uh, in 2018. Uh, in 2020, we really uh, uh went out and started promoting lanka qr so you will see a lot of ads uh regarding lanka qr and you will find all your banks also you have a lot of um promotions regarding relating to lanka qr so we um so when we come up with a standardized code or any standard right be the common pos um uh CEFs, all of those when we go in for standardization you can't go uh, do a standardization alone like no industry can go for a standardization by themselves so the payment institutions the lanka clear who is the operator everyone came together and with the aim of uh, moving to what we call what is called a less cash so it's not a cashless so there's a difference less cash means we are using less cash and that is what it is Cashless means no cash, right? We are not seeking a cashless state in Sri Lanka. Uh, like certain some countries like Sweden, they are seeking that cashless state. We are not, right? And also increasing financial inclusion because um, really digital financial inclusion because uh, you don't require a lot of infrastructure to have use a QR code as a merchant, right? Um, so. Um, QR code is connected to uh, just pay and CEFs, which is um, which connects the bank directly to the customer's bank account and to the merchant's bank account. So you have an interbank transaction ha happening at uh, real time. So that that is the real advantage of Lanka QR, right? And it is a very low cost solution and it's targeting small and medium so it's not targeting the big companies who can negotiate very low credit card fees it is targeting primarily um, small and medium customers who don't have a lot of negotiating power with credit card companies or issuers right uh, and they have to go for the 2.5 or 3 percent right um, so the customer is not charged and uh, merchants are given the sticker free of charge and um, we set the MDR for 0.5% uh, in 2020, and I think that is getting continued, right? Um, in addition, uh, we also gave concessions for government services of, during 2020 as well, right? So all this is given because we are targeting the small and medium because we really want them to come into the uh, 
digital payments networks because what we find is the credit cards alone was not enough and it was too expensive on them still if you go to shops there is the credit cards they will just they they are supposed to honor all cards they can't charge us extra they can't charge can't charge us the 2.5% but they are not happy right so this is what we um, tried to solve so um we had this um we had this uh, we started this promotion in uh, september we went to matale and in october we were in uh, kalambo and then we had been continuously going uh, so in january we were in uh, kote uh, then we were in gaul so we have candy we are going all over the country and promoting lanka qr and we find that in that short period the numbers are going up right these are all the institutions that uh, have lank, that issue lanka qr codes uh, so now we are we are moving on to uh, payment instruments and now we are moving to the next phase of technology right which is smart devices so now the the payment instrument is disappearing right it's it continuously disappear now this is a this one is a ring right so with the ring you can pay and this is the uh, from the fridge you can directly you can look what is uh, what is not there and just uh, pay uh, for your food and buy order it from there itself so you can see that the device and the user they're converging they're becoming one and then a the next thing that i wanted to introduce was e checks because this is something that uh, that is under consideration uh, at banks at many central banks uh, we will discuss more about checks as we discuss this uh, as we discuss in subject uh, checks in the subsequent uh, lessons um, now let me just show you what mobile check deposit is let me see if this is the correct video so that is different to an e check now an e check now that is mobile check deposit and that is already quite popular in countries like the us where the check usage is very high um and uh, but e check is where the entire check is electronic now in the mobile check they were they had the manual check the the paper check and then it was taking a picture and then um, uh depositing it so what the step it's missing is now in sri lanka we have to go to the bank and deposit the check and then the image is what get processed right now here instead of the bank taking the image we ourselves can take the image from our phone electronic check is different electronic check is when the full check is electronic it's a it's it's a basically a, a, a software generated check now there are uh, now with uh, in uh, blockchain and cryptography um the the idea of having electronic checks is being emerged and i just wanted to introduce this to you uh, and we can discuss this as we discuss uh, the bills of exchange
Um, okay, now we go to virtual currencies, right? Now, virtual currency. Are there sorry? Are there any questions? Um, let's see. Um, are there any questions uh, with what I have been saying so far? Any questions? Because now we have moved away from the, we've moved away from the main uh, payment instruments, the traditional payment instruments and how they evolve. We are going into a new area of alternative payments, uh, payment methods. So if you have any questions, uh, okay, if not, um, I will move on. So, um, so virtual currencies are basically, as I mentioned in the first half, uh, are privately created currencies, right? They're unregulated, they're digital money, uh, and they're usually uh, controlled and uh, issued by its developers, like, and they could be random people. Um, anyone who mines a Bitcoin or comes up with a similar uh, uh, coin, digital coin, is a virtual currency issuer. Now, the problem there is now, if you take central bank money, it's issued by the central bank. The central bank, under the Monetary Law Act, gives a guarantee for the value, right? And that's in our objectives. That's why we have to take care of inflation because we guarantee the value, right? Now, in a virtual currency, there is nothing, no such value. There's no person guaranteeing the value. It is just the coin that is getting created. And the value gets determined by the market. The market on based on demand and supply, they will, it will get a value. So that is the problem here. Now there is a big risk and we don't know where the money is. When we purchase a Bitcoin, we don't know who is actually getting that money. Now when you when you get money for, let's say, your job, it is for the service that you have provided, right? And you are getting money and in monetary economics, then you have how the central bank issues money based on its assets. Now, here there is no such base. There is no underlying asset. It's just getting created. So it is just a concept in people's heads and people are just buying in um, just created, creating a value for it. And there are many, with, after Bitcoin, there were many virtual currencies that came up in the world, right? And they are there for various reasons. Um, now, th this, this slide has all these links to Coindesk and you can actually go if you are interested in, uh, I just took this directly from Coindesk. Uh, Coindesk is uh, one of the major, blogs uh, or the websites that always reports on uh, cryptocurrencies um so if you're interested you can go there and there's a lot to, there's a lot to read um and um so bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency right that was able to successfully rec record the transactions and they're decentralized that means they, now, central bank is a centralized authority, right? So the money is getting issued from central authority that is giving its value. Now, in the Bitcoin, it gets authorized in a decentralized. There's a distributed ledger. So uh, all those people with uh, in the in the distributed ledger in the nodes will have to authorize that transaction, and that will say that the transaction is correct, right? Um, and um, so Bitcoin has become very very successful because it ran on it had qualities that other previous coins didn't have which is that uh, it was because of the blockchain because it became Im immutable and there was also an audit trail so uh, the the chance of you losing or there being fraud was less right um 
and uh, so apparently there are only 21 million bitcoins that will ever be created this is to maintain the value of it right and uh, it says that new coins are minted every 10 minutes by bitcoin miners who help maintain the network by adding new transaction data to the blockchain right so you can use these links for more um, information now what this means is that anyone with a lot of computing power you need a lot of computing power and i recently read that uh, cryptocurrency mining is some is taking the power of like entire countries uh, because it requires so much power right so we have to really balance this out whether it is worth it right because there is it's the value is high people are continuously mining but whether it is worth it is a real question right now we can see now look at i i took this from this link it's virtual currencies are not remember we have to remember that virtual currencies are not legal tender so no country has said it is legal tender no central bank has said that uh which means if you have a if you transact using virtual currencies bitcoin or ethereum or any of them it's a private transaction it's not guaranteed there is no you can't say uh, now if someone gives you uh, uh, let's say a, a fraudulent uh, 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 like note or coin or something like that then you can come to the central bank and seek some uh, some 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 save assistance but uh, here this is a private transaction right um now we can see but we can see that in the world that the values are always very very high right now these are getting pumped up artificially so there's no underlying asset so and the values are very volatile so when they are very volatile again that the 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 stability of it goes so people you can one you can make a lot of money you can also lose a lot of money so that issue is also there right now the three features of cryptocurrencies one is it's anonymous right and so because of that it can it gets used for a lot of money laundering for for, for dark web related uh, uh, transactions and then another is that it is decentralized so there is no central authority um, issuing the money um, and the way that you can acquire is one is you can mine it and the other is you can get it from exchanges right um, but it is susceptible so immutable means because of the way that um, it gets authorized because of the decentralized authorization system and its encryption it becomes immutable so you can't like hack into it's very difficult to hack into a bitcoin right um and uh but it is susceptible to loss now there have been several exchanges where uh people have hacked into the exchanges and stolen the cryptocurrencies right not not hack the cryptocurrency itself but if you're you, if you're not using a, a safe wallet to store your cryptocurrencies it can get lost right and there have been huge losses um so um i put in a discussion point uh, regarding uh, virtual currencies and their risks uh, would someone like to share their views or is this the first time you're hearing anything if you would like to say about the virtual currencies because there is interest even in sri lanka for people to buy right and there is an immense amount of risk um, and globally now central banks are turning against i recently read the fca the financial conduct authority in the uk has also banned uh, now china has also banned we also don't license so but people are buying because of the value going up so what are as bankers what are your views right um 
I want you all to go through this and do some research on cryptocurrencies and come back and let's let's visit revisit this discussion point because it's really important because this goes to the very core of our industry, right? Banks are sort of creations from the central bank, right? And they use central bank based money, right? So what happens if there's an alternative currency system? What happens to the banking system? What happens to the central banks? What happens to money as we know it? What happens? So just think about it because it's very, it's a very fundamental question, right? About money and payments. And when we are, and we are at a time when it's, there's a lot of democratization because of the internet. So people have a lot of power they can create their own uh currencies they can distribute it very fast across the world and that is really what happened now this is not the first time <clears throat> an alternative currency has been created but alternative currencies have been largely restricted to their geographical area so if let's say uh, in the colombo area we create a currency it sticks there because there is there was no way to move the currency across the world but now with the internet and you put the code out, the, 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 the code to mine the Bitcoin from anywhere in the world, you can do it, right? Everyone can join that alternative system. So in that circumstance, we have to, as bankers, we have to think what, what is our role here? What is our purpose? Why? Is there a monetary system, right? Why is it important to preserve a single system? So these questions as bankers, you really need to think because it is not just learning what are the payment instruments and, and then how to do it, but really think because of the fundamental point of our economy is run on this monetary system, right? So if something is true, something is to um, challenge it then we have to think really what is it what is it get what is getting challenged can these two things coexist right we have to think of it like that right now as i said central bank 2018 uh, 16th of september we um, made this press release at that point also virtual currency uh, uh, value was really fluctuating and going up and uh, people were calling the bank and saying okay how can we buy can we buy and then we put this press release basically what we said was that there are a lot of risks right and uh, and it could be used for money laundering and uh, aml cft related issues so therefore we don't license it, right we don't license it we don't authorize it and banks also have followed this and they don't if they know that uh, bitcoins or, or virtual currencies are being uh, bought using uh, their cards or anything like that they uh, block the payment or most of them do right and that is the the stand that we are taking and we find that a lot of countries are now uh, following that because of the immense volatility of the value now we go full circle, right? Which is central bank digital currency. Now central bank digital currency is taking this whole thing to the next level, right? Just the way the credit card uh, evolved and became moved from a card to the virtual card, the central banks are also now considering having digital currency if people are moving away from cash for various reasons it could be germs it could be inefficiency it could be cost now central banks have been presented with an alternative technology that they can use which is the cryptographic currency right and now all the central banks have come together and they are discussing how that this can be done. Of course, this can't be done overnight because um, it, every the system should be. You can't transfer um, transfer digital currencies on the existing systems, right? They are made because in the existing electronic uh, digital systems, what is actually going is a message. The token itself is not moving. 
right? In digital currency, the token, the software, the code that that gets moved, right? In in now when you since you're all in banks, you will see swift messages and all of that. Those are messages. They are saying, okay, I'm moving from here to there, and at uh, settlement the money actually gets moved right otherwise it's all that is moving about is uh, the message through correspondent banking or intermediaries it is just the message that is going now here it is it becomes peer to peer peer directly the transaction is happening right it is ultimate it is just like cash it is becoming peer to peer so then the systems have to change and there's a lot of things to get considered when you're doing that right so that's why you have this what they call the money flower right so this is kind of like a venn diagram but it, it gives more room to uh, to have alternative uh, options right so you have in the in the electronic uh, petal you have in the middle central bank issued currencies right and then right outside there is virtual currencies right there are cryptocurrencies and then cash this is also central bank issued right so there's cash here right so cash is also a peer-to-peer -peer. now this is how you read it right cash is also a peer-to-peer -peer. now it is the ultimate peer-to-peer -peer. there is no intermediary nothing available you, you don't need you don't need internet you don't need a computer nothing you just need to have it in your hand and then give it so it is so all these other payment instruments are trying to emulate the efficiency of cash right um while getting rid of its inefficiencies so that's why you have this it's here it's outside the electronic right it's universally accessible right so when you in the universally accessible you have cryptocurrencies as well right and then you have all these falling as universally accessible so remember that uh, this was from a research from bank of international settlements which is the sort of the imf for payments um uh, read this article if you like you can just uh, search for the money flower and it will come up um, this, this is the way forward and this is something that is being seriously considered right um, <coughs> so any questions so far right so now we discussed central bank currency as well so what i want to say is now we're going like this and it looks like we're heading back here now cash is becoming digital currency right so this all these faces are going to get digitized right so it looks like we are going full circle and this is the reason in the last lecture i was saying let's go back to basics because <clears throat> through digitalization we are seeing a resurgence of old instruments and methods through the digital format right they're, they're getting rid of getting rid of the inefficiencies of those old systems but really trying to capture the efficiencies of those systems right like being it being peer-to-peer -peer and universally accessible right so we are seeing that this is going to the next level um, so that is that for evolution of payments. Now, I wanted to discuss this with you all and not really discuss, I wanted to um, introduce this to you all. If you are interested, let me know. Now, this is the, this is sort of the theoretical side of why payment instruments become successful, right? Now, so far I have not taught you the theoretical side but i i did mention that there are people who want nobel prices based on them and um i'll just introduce these concepts and if you all like i can go into detail in subsequent lectures and sort of explain these right so as i said at the beginning of the second section uh, second session you know i can let me know whether this is advanced enough or whether you want it more advanced because 
as I, I as I specialize in this area, I can make this as advanced as you want, or I can make it much simpler as well. So let me know your your feedback. I have my email address at the end. So if you want, you can so feel free to um, feel free to um, email me and tell me what your thoughts are. Right. Um, and so now the success of payment uh, instruments. Uh, now we've been discussing so many factors. We discussed, you know, it's not just the efficiency. Now, some several of you highlighted these facts. You know, um, the public perception, where the investment goes to, right? Why? Where do you decide to invest? You know, several factors um, affect the success of a payment uh, instrument. Now, theoretically, this goes into something all network effects and externalities now which means that in a, a payment instrument I, I kept saying the concept of acceptance right now which means it you have to join the network right you have to now um, now everyone here is using Sri Lankan rupees so if I'm using yuan or some you know yen or some other currency then i won't be able to i won't be able to transact in sri lanka right if i want to transact in sri lanka i must use uh, lkr i must join this network right so also let's say let's say uh, for example let's say free me right now free me allows peer to peer um, like you can just pay from the phone number but if i'm not in the free me network i can't uh, I can't get that advantage. Of course, sir, now we are, we are, we at Lanka Clear is introducing that. We will discuss that later. But what I'm saying is, if we just want to go directly from the free system, then we have to join that network. So when that, so and and also for free me, it becomes uh, successful if more and more people join it. If there are only about two people, then they won't have sufficient transactions, right? So it goes both ways. So the network has to ex expand for both the customer and the issuer uh, to and the service provider to benefit, right? So this is what is the called the, the network effects. And then there are positive network externalities that come with it. Now, what um, Tiro and Rochelle uh, found out was that this creates a two-sided market. So if you, and he did it from the credit cards, which is what he said was one side is you have the customer, you have to uh, increase the number of customers. And the other side, you have to increase the number of merchants accepting cards, right? So there are many credit card rules like, um, you know, you had to honor all cards and then for the customer it is free, but the merchant, has to pay a discount rate, but he can't discriminate it with uh, cash, like he can't give a cash discount. Um, and all these rules come in because there's a two-sided market and there are certain power dynamics on the two sides, right? And this is a very important aspect. So now if you take all these, an example, now we have, um, Lanka QR promotions everywhere. Now we are not uh, necessarily promoting it to the customers. We are promoting it to the merchants because merchants must ac accept the Lanka QR. If there is no point in customers going and getting Lanka QR enabled apps if the uh, merchants are not accepting Lanka QR. So that, that there are two sides to the market and payment instruments have what is known as a two-sided market. Now this is different to the normal market that we learn in economics which is buy and sell one side right there are two-sided markets and then payment uh, because of technology because of apps and the, the the infrastructure it creates platforms that is from like one service can provide multiple one payment service provider can provide uh delivery channels for multiple types of payments, right? So it creates platforms and now a good example is 
let's say easy cash or m cash right now now they are having utility payments uh, institutional payments and all of that now it is slowly becoming a platform which is that multiple people merchants who want to have their uh, who want to now uh, basically there are many customers they have a big customer base uh, mobitel and dialog so the merchants are now joining in to uh, access and benefit that high level of customers so that those customers can directly pay right so those are the those are some of the sort of very high level i described uh, so the theoretical aspects of it and the, the, these are highly researched and platforms and two sided markets uh, and multi sided markets they when we are going into fintech and we are discussing that level it becomes really important um, whether you want me to teach this in detail or not um, i will touch this slightly when we are discussing fintech but whether you want this in detail uh, would you like this in detail or is this level sufficient for you okay i will leave you to give it a thought and you can uh, message me and tell if you are interested otherwise i will go in the usual format right and you can if you are really interested you can read about these things they are well documented okay so that is that so that uh, i'm completing the uh, the lesson for today uh, are there any questions Are there any questions? Um, if there are no questions, then I will stop. Uh, please go go through the slides again. And if you have any questions, my email address is at the end of the slides. Um, and uh, I will share this presentation with you because I added the last slide. So I will give it to um, Kaling and he will share it with you. Um, so if there are no further questions, we will uh, end for today. Have a good week. And thank you for those who joined and participated today. It's always very, very uh, useful and enjoyable even for me when you all are participating. So thank you very much. Um, yes, have a good week. <laughs>